It's a pleasure to, to chat again. Um, our conversations are always very interesting. Um, I'm, I'm John Nasta and I'm an innovation theorist. Basically what I do is look at how innovation, technology and medicine come together to change fundamental aspects of humanity today. And I think most notably is that the inflection point that we all talk about so much has been redefined um, and, and shifted in many ways around the uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. This is a fascinating question. I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say it is less significant than people say it is. I believe that when we have um, the ability to look back, to evaluate the numbers, to look at all the issues, um, the COVID-19 virus will not define the century. But I think what's going to happen is that the COVID-19 virus is driving fundamental change in the way we lead our lives and the way we leverage technology. So is it a catastrophic virus? Yes, it's tragic. Um, as I study the numbers in America, will 2.2 million people die? No. Will 250,000 people die? No. The, the revised estimates just, just today um, have taken that number down to 60,000. Now, of course that's tragic. Of course that has a, a tremendous impact on many, many people throughout the United States looking at that model. But we have to look at that in the context of the range of deaths for, let's say, traditional seasonal flu, which is about 28,000 to 61,000. So I think we have to put on our scientist hats and, and take off that, that empathic humanitarian hat and look at this objectively. I believe that we'll be able to get through this. We'll evolve with interesting technologies, medicines, all sorts of interesting things. And that's going to be the defining element of COVID. It's not the deaths. It's the recalibration of life as we see it. We're not going to become social isolationists. We're going to expand the role of technology in the form of communicating like this, as well as simple clinical modalities such as telemedicine. And that will catch on and that can do things like lower costs and expand care to people who need it around the world. So I, I think that the mark on humanity that COVID-19 makes might be surprisingly interesting. When you go out, do you always bring your umbrella? I know I don't. And I think that being prepared is a wonderful motto. I think it's a good conceptual idea. But for me, I think that what we need to do is prioritize preparedness. For example, um, do we have enough iodine stockpiled if we have a radioactive emergency? Do we have enough water purification systems in backup so that we, if there's a water emergency, are we prepared for that? Do we have a backup to our electrical grid, battery backup, solar backup? You know, here's the, here's the problem that I have is that yes, we probably could have been more prepared, but the number of catastrophes are, are broad and wide and I'm not exactly sure how we best prepare. Now, that being said, I think the important thing for us to do is look at what are the top social emergencies? What are the biggest issues? And I think that a global pandemic might be top of the list. So we need to go back and take a look at our emergency preparedness. The, the, the tragedy, the irony, the difficulty of this is that we don't live in the world of infinite resources. We live in a world of extraordinarily limited resources. Look at GDP, look at budgetary constraints, look at healthcare. 
even with a country that spends 8.8% of its GDP on healthcare, which is Italy, who was defined as being one of the better healthcare systems in the EU, was met with catastrophe. So I think that we have to be, I'm not going to say that we need to be better planners. I think we need to be smarter planners. And those are the key learnings from COVID-19 that will help us be ready for the next cluster of emergencies. Now, now there's a couple of factors here. Number one is what are the real data coming out of, of China? I don't know. Um, 80,000 was the total number. Uh, I'm not sure. Many people are, are saying that, that these data are suspect. I, I don't think we should necessarily say that it is, but I think it's going to be important to take a closer look at Japan, uh, China rather, number one. Number two, the supply side or the supply chain is precarious. I think we have to take a good hard look at that. Number three, we have to look at, at value and cost. Profit margin is very thin because we can shift some of these manufacturing costs overseas, but it puts us in a precarious position. So I think that the relationship that countries have with China will be re-explored. And maybe this shines the light on what is an oppressive regime. So when we talk about human rights issues, when we talk about healthcare and wellness, I think it might be time to revisit that relationship, but make it grow in positive and interesting ways. It's not just kind of quashing China or coming down on China in a hard way, but here's a chance to engage in them with a positive dialogue that can actually change the entire world. I think that what we're seeing now is the proverbial inflection point. You know, I've talked about inflection points a lot, but with respect to technology, and let's use telemedicine as an example, because I think that's appropriate um, in this dynamic, we're seeing a triple inflection point, a triple inflection point. Number one, we're seeing the technological availability. Technology is here, people are using it, and it's widely available. Number two, is the regulations are changing. So the legal construct, the regulatory concerns are being shifted because of the, the um, global emergency. And thirdly, we're seeing a clinical imperative. We need to keep patients who are moderately ill or potentially uh, uh, with a life-threatening condition maybe away from the hospital. We need them to communicate with a healthcare professional through technology so they could know what the right path forward is. Stay at home, self-isolate, or get yourself to the hospital because what I'm sensing from you is that you might be on, on the verge of a catastrophic condition, or let's push that out a little bit further. Maybe we could use our Apple Watch and look at our pulses. Maybe we could use these inexpensive pulse oximeters that we all have on our on our watches that no one ever uses. They were put on there because they were cheap. Now we're finding if we could measure blood oxygen levels, we may be able to see how people are doing, knowing that, uh, that COVID-19 seems to be probably a systemic event that manifests principally in the lungs. So we see the technology, we see the regulatory freedom to do that, and we see a tremendous social and clinical imperative. So this is going to push people into the domain of technology. Uh, now, now, from a, a functional and practical point of view, I saw people having Passover seders where they use Zoom meetings, where they put their computer on the dining room table and everyone watched each other on the computer. I believe that these little steps forward will expose people to the wonder of technology. And even though we're being forced into this dynamic because of the virus, once the toothpaste is out of the tube, it's going to be very, very hard to get it back in. This truly is the century of science. We are seeing that science, the power of wisdom and knowledge,
can transcend social and political concerns to come up with a higher truth. And people will, will get a new understanding. So for me, I think that we will see increased children studying science, probably more medical students going to medical school, and, and a renewed interest in maybe less video games, but more understanding the notion of viral dynamics. So I'm very, very optimistic. I don't think people are going to be afraid of medicine, looking at, at, at physicians who were dying on the front lines. I think that we will see science as part of the battlefield of human evolution and human expansion. And that's where the excitement is. That's, you know, if you want to change the world, science is the domain that lets individuals do that. And it's a very, very exciting time. Anytime I hear the phrase new world order, I always get a little nervous. Um, I think the world will change. I'm not exactly sure what the fundamental dynamics are of COVID-19. I think we're still learning how infective was the virus? What is the true number of patients, the N in the denominator of the equation? What was the, the, the effectiveness of drug therapy, of hydroxychloroquine, of social distancing, of the use of a respirator, of positive uh, and expiratory pressure? All these dynamics are, are being evaluated now. So without knowing what that issue is, I'm, I'm going to hedge on saying what the new world order is, but I think that we're going to see changes. I think that 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 the emergence of of, of a self awareness in terms of vulnerability might emerge. Now, is that going to evolve actionist perspective? Perhaps in some instances. So I think we have to be aware of that. But I think that that global unity of one voice, one world, um, when we see individual countries acting in their own interest, um, will be problematic. So I think we will shine the light on the power of the arbiter. Who is the arbiter? Is it the WHO? Is it the UN? Is it the EU? Maybe it's science. Maybe the role of validated scientific thinking becomes a little bit higher in the pecking order. You know, when I, when I watch the press conferences, I see politicians, um, career politicians, I see people who drive the decision-making and then have secondary support or tertiary support from science. So I think that we'll see more of the science. The problem is, is the science right? I mean, you know, look, I can ask you a simple question about cholesterol. Is is bacon good or is bacon bad? Are carbs good or are carbs bad? We can't even respond or answer some of those fundamental questions. There's a lot of controversy around it. So I think that while science may be a powerful, validated voice, that validation might, might be scrutinized and we might come up with new ideas. So scientists are not always correct. They're human. And that's the world we live in. And that's that's really the dynamic that's going to evolve, the nature of our humanity and connectivity mediated largely by technology. My message for the world is be optimistic. The promise of tomorrow is bold and is powerful. And I think that, that COVID-19 has alerted us to that reality, that we can work together, that we can band together. When I see physicians from other countries going into battle, when I see people sharing equipment, sharing ideas, as we're doing here, I have, I have great enthusiasm and optimism for tomorrow. We are all connected in very unique and interesting ways. So for me, I look forward to an exciting adventure.